Hi, my name is Andy Tidy and welcome back to another episode of Canal Hunter Series 8. In this series, we are tracing James Brindley's original canal as it followed its 22 mile route between Birmingham in the south and Wolverhampton in the north. In this series so far, we've explored all the twists and turns between the coal wharfs of Birmingham and the collieries of Balls Hill near West Bromwich. Well, that represented what I would describe as phase A of James Brindley's project. Well, it's not much good having a source of fuel and the industry to go with it, unless there's also a way to get your finished goods out to a wider market. And for the Birmingham Canal, it needed to connect into the Grand Cross, which was being developed by Brindley. And the closest point to that in the short term was the Staffs and Worcester Canal, just to the north of Wolverhampton. And that is what phase two is all about. Brindley's second phase was completed in a couple of years and then it rendered the Balls Hill branch, which we explored in the last episode, a mere branch canal. So we're picking up the trail at the top of today's three Spawn Lane locks. But you must remember that back in Brindley's days, this was actually halfway up a flight of locks, which led to a short 1,000 yard summit at Smevik. The area at the top of today's Spawn Lane locks would be unrecognisable to Brindley. Not least because for the last 50 years, the canal has had a roof on it. Wind the clocks back to the pre-motorway era and it all looks so different. The area was dominated by the Chance and Hunt works behind me and surrounded by a residential community. But the construction of the M5 swept all that away. And having failed to identify any other credible north-south route across the region, they decided to build the motorway on stilts over the top of the canal becoming the Albury Viaduct that we know today. It flies from West Bromwich to Hales Owen, giving today's slow moving traffic those classic urban views over the black country. Now, even if Brindley did manage to get his head around the intrusion of the M5 into this landscape, and I brought him to this spot, he would still probably deny that this was the course of his canal. And of course, he would be right, because his canal channel deviated a bit here and there, and the construction of the motorway forced the canal channel to one side or another to accommodate all of those pillars. But beyond that, if I took him to Stuart Aqueduct, then he would again deny that that was the course of his canal. So let's go there and take a look. And what happened here is what happened in so many places when an aqueduct is needed to carry a transport route underneath an established canal. The new aqueduct is built just to the side of the old line, keeping the original channel operating until the aqueduct is complete and ready for business. The old maps show the original line of the canal being just over there. And then this section was brought later on to accommodate the new aqueduct. So the whole line of the canal was shifted slightly to the north, resulting in the kinks in the canal that we see today. Well, so far we've found James Brindley's original channel and Thomas Telford's later one playing cat and mouse with each other. But now we have finally broken free of Telford's main line and Brindley's old main line is free to continue uninterrupted all the way through to Tipton. I mean, to be honest, I say uninterrupted, but this area is so radically altered from what used to be here. Here at Blakely Hall Bridge, there's the amazing juxtaposition of a, an old humpback bridge standing actually underneath the ramparts of the Oldbury Viaduct. And from here, the line of the canal and the motorway are pretty much twinned up for two miles quite handy if you happen to be coming through here when it's raining. This was an area that was dominated by the chemical industry. Albright and Wilson, Chance and Hunt to name but two. And, and alongside the chemical industry there was also the car tar distilleries. The largest of these being Midland Tar Distillers. And they had a basin just around the corner here. This was the place where all of those distinctive Thomas Clayton of Oldbury tar boats used to come. 
they would unload their coal tar, this would be distilled and all the useful bits and pieces would be taken out of it. The last commercial trade out of this area was the phosphorus waste coming out of Albright and Wilson's. Alfred Matty and Co took that away in boats and they pulled it to a place called Rattle Chain Lagoon where it was all dumped into an old clay pit, sealed over and hopefully that's the last we'll ever see of it. Strict adherence to Brindley's original line is short-lived as we emerge from the M5 because we soon reach one of the big deviations on the canal route. We've already noticed that Brindley favoured a winding contour canal because it meant less digging. And his view was also that if you took a winding course you pass through more places and that meant more customers. Well, you can't really fault the man's logic but I don't think he ever really envisaged the success that the canal would become and that these loops and bends that he favoured would one day become bottlenecks. The canal circuit round the town of Albury was one such bottleneck. The town was a mass of wharves, clay pits, brickworks and chemical works and all these industries had boats hanging around. They built basins everywhere but still it became hard going and as early as 1820 the canal company realised that a bypass to the north from Whimsey Bridge made a lot of sense. In a way, this straightening foreshadowed the massive Telford shortenings which took place just eight years later. I rather suspect that this was seen as a prototype of things to come. Whilst a bypass had been built, the Albury Loop itself remained operational through to the 1950s. Most traces have been lost to various urban improvements over the years, but I've unearthed a lot of old images which let us pick out the main landmarks and recreate the route in video format. With the 1820s out to the west, Albury Town Centre stood on a veritable island bounded by canals on all sides. Given the developers continuing reluctance to build on what is probably a very toxic canal bed, the route can best be appreciated from the air. So I will do what canal hunter normally does and fly the route at about 250 feet and intersperse the video footage with archive photos from the early part of the 20th century. I hope you enjoy this little gem.
Well, ironworks featured heavily on the southern end of this loop, switching over to coal wharves, timber yards and boat yards as you moved around. And then to the north there were the massive clay pits and the brickworks. And then finally, just before you re-enter the 1820 link, there was the massive Albury Railway Interchange Basin with the Albury Boiler Works opposite. Easily discernible in the old photos by the amazing aerial crane that went right over the top of the canal. Well, it's the northern end that's been most redeveloped over the years. So the extensive boatyards, the housing and Danks works have all gone. So we have to use our imagination and, of course, my little red dotted lines to work out where it all used to go. So the Albury Loop is nearly completely lost. Nearly, but not utterly. Right at the very end, just where the course joins the 1820 straightening, there is a rectangular cooling pond. And, amazingly, this is one fragment of Brindley's original route. I'd like to have shown you this pond, but I can't fly the drone there because the wind's too high. I would have walked down the towpath, but it's being redeveloped and resurfaced. So I'm a bit thwarted. We'll have to use some archive photos instead. But now we are back on Brindley's old main line. And that's where we're going to leave this episode of Canal Hunter. In the next, we're going to be covering a lot of ground all the way through to Tipton. But till then, cheerio and happy hunting.